back to the book of Luke, chapter 23, again today. Tonight, we looked at the Lord's prayer there on the cross. I want to leave the conversion of the thief today, Lord willing. Well, but the is correct, there is even a quote Mother's Day message on the cross. Christ committed the care of his mother to John. Go ahead. Go to John chapter 19, it tells you that John and Mary were close by, and it says to Mary, Woman, behold thy son. And he turned to John and said, Behold thy mother. Go ahead. We even Jesus knew the importance of making sure your mother was taken care of. So let's go to Luke chapter 23, we'll begin reading verse. 38 through 43. So then, an subscript, excuse me, and a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, This not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Amen. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, today I, verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this privilege and opportunity we have to gather with our people today, Lord, and I. Pray that you bless now with the preaching of thy word. You might use the message to accomplish thy will. Thank you for the singing in the Sunday school hour that we've had, Lord. I pray that you get all the glory and honor of everything here today. I pray that you can bless Adam as we resume back to his class. That you would help him teach to us the truth of thy word in that, Lord. I thank you for Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, Lord, that you would make salvation possible for us. We pray that you might be pleased even today to say, well, I'll still hear a moment. Yes, Lord. You might prick the hearts of one listening on the internet even more that you might use it to cause them to actually hear the gospel for the first time. I just pray that you would bless now as your words proclaim. Be with us, Lord. Serve us up with your people. Lead God and direct the Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 Well, I began here with this the superscription on the cross, as it is of note here, especially in the conversion of the thief. And what was said it was written in three different languages, Greek, Latin, Hebrew. Luke records it as this is the king of the Jews. Well, each gospel records it slightly differently. And they're all correct. They all contain parts of one or the other. Mark's right. gospel says just simply the king of the Jews. John's Gospel says Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. If I had a quote unquote favorite, it might be Matthew, which says, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Amen. So we'll take note of that when we get down a few verses later. But it was an accurate verse. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 tell us that the wise men that came, they sought the one who was born King of the Jews. Amen. So even from birth. So now he was then king of the Jews. Well, they yeah. went. The problem was they were looking for a different kind of king. Right. Mm -hmm. In verse 39 it says, And one of the male factors, criminals in this case, they were thieves, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Mocking Christ, really. You know, if you're really the right. Christ, why don't you save us? You know, he would really have no reason to save the thieves, would he, with that attitude? Right. Even if he took himself down from the cross? You know, this wasn't the first mocking that Jesus had encountered. The chief priests and publicans and the rulers had all mocked him. Mm -hmm. Soldiers had mocked him. And even if you study the other Gospels, you'll find the thieves had mocked him previously, too. Right. Let's turn over to Mark for just a moment. Mark chapter 15, verses 31 and 32. Let's go ahead and read. Starting in verse 29, it says, And they that passed by 
railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, oh, thou that destroys the temple and raises it up in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking and said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, he, or himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe, and they that were crucified with him reviled him. In Matthew's Gospel records the very similar thing in chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse 41. It says, Likewise also the chief priests mocking him, but the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and he will, and we will believe him. You know, they wouldn't really believe him even. Right. Then. He trusted in God, verse 43. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. But these also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. <laughs> these the thieves, both of them had mocked him previously, but here we find just the one mocking him. Right. And the other rebukes him. We see in verse 40. It says, But the other sent, answered, the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? You're hanging here on a cross and you're mocking the Christ who's hanging on the cross. You know, really what authority do you have to do that? Right. It's like the the saying goes, a pot calling the kettle black. Right. right. He certainly couldn't save himself from the cross, and yet he's going to mock right. Christ to come down and right. save him. He says, he asked a pretty important question there. Dost thou not fear God? Hmm. You know, fear of God is said to be the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. Amen. Fear of God is something that's lacking today, isn't it? Paul tells us that the wicked don't fear God, though, do they? In right. Romans chapter 3, when he's describing the depravity man, he says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Right. Well, that doesn't mean that we have to cower in a corner and hide from them, but there's no respect or reverence for them. There's really none at all in our day, is there? That's right. This, this fellow here, he didn't fear God either. He was dying, about to slip off into eternity, and and here he is mocking the Christ of God. There we go. But we see in this that God is sovereign, don't we? No. There is two thieves here, both in the same condition. Right. You know, one believes God, and one yeah. is hard. That's it. Well, as far as I can tell, our situations are identical. They're both these, they're both on a cross, they both saw Jesus from the same perspective. Yeah. They both had the same opportunities, if you will. Yeah. And yet, I want to say to one is harder. Right. It must be attributed to God's sovereignty even in salvation. Mm -hmm. He gives yeah. mercy to whom he will and he hardens whom he will. That's right. <laughs> But as I mentioned Wednesday night, God's sovereignty is not to destroy the responsibility of man. Man is still very much responsible for it. Amen. Amen. Well, he still commands all men everywhere to repent. The message is still believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I like what Pink said on this, I shared on Facebook the other day. It says, we say it again, God's sovereignty is never meant to destroy man's responsibility. We are to make diligent use of all the means which God has appointed for the salvation of souls. We are bidden to preach the gospel to every creature. Grace is free. The invitation is brought up to take in whosoever believeth. Christ turns away none who come to him. Yet after we have done all and after we have planted and watered, it is God who giveth the increase. And this he does as best pleases the sovereign will. Said. We plant, we water, but God gives the increase. We Amen. ought not to forget that. Well, we can, man has schemed up all these other things that they want, but <laughs> really we cannot save souls as much as sometimes we wish we could. Right. 
You know, we also have seen this, that salvation must be by grace from beginning to end. I think we're all familiar with Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace are you saved through faith. Yeah. And then not yourselves as the gift of God. Amen. Amen. Works. Let's name man should boast. So the thief is the perfect example of this. He, he had a lawless life before his conversion, and he had no life of service after his conversion, did he? Right. And he couldn't make himself worthy, quote unquote. He couldn't, quote unquote, hold out faithful or keep his salvation. He had no opportunity to do either of those, did he? But no, he still looked to Christ. His salvation had to be completely of grace. Yeah. But he couldn't work. His hands were nailed to a cross. He couldn't, quote unquote, turn over a new leaf because he was dying. Right. He couldn't walk in the paths of what we call righteousness because his feet were fastened to the cross. He really had nothing to offer God, did he? That's it. Really, none of us do, if we be honest with ourselves. You're right. He was totally dependent on Christ for salvation. Yeah. And really, just the same, we must abandon everything else except Christ for salvation. Amen. You know, good works, our righteousness, our baptism, our being a good person, our church membership, or affiliation, family members, whatever it may be that we are clinging to and trusting in, besides Christ, will fail us. Amen. Well, I like what Spurgeon said on this. He said, I think I am throwing all my good works overboard and lashing myself to the plank of free grace, for I hope to swim the glory on it. Amen. Amen. The works have their place, but they're not in salvation. They're afterwards. <laughs> you know, to our knowledge here, the only quote, quote witness that we have of the thief, that the thief had, excuse me, was the mockings of Christ. Christ's prayer and then the inscription on the cross. We we're never told that he ever encountered Christ before this. Being a thief, it's not likely that he hung out with the crowd that followed after Christ. <laughs> but really, what more is needed than this is Jesus, the King of the Jews? Amen. Yeah. And salvations of grace, what more do you need than Jesus? Amen. What did Acts say? There is none, salvation none other, and there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Yeah. And then again, Paul writes, for <coughs> at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. That's yeah. it. And there's a lot of power in the name of Jesus. And mm. All power. Mm. You know, I always liked what Hobby Life put on their semi trucks that Jesus is Lord, not a swear word. Amen. Amen. People use it as a, you know, a swear word, a by word, just a passing by. And they, they fail to realize the power just in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I, really, that's all we have to do is speak Jesus. Christ and Him crucified, as the way Paul said it. We don't have to invent these gimmicks and themes and entertainments. And we don't need this repeat this prayer after me or Romans Road or ABCs. That's it. Amen. We just need to preach Jesus. Yeah. You know, this, this thief here, though, he was representative of us, really. We really we consider what we were naturally, what the unbeliever is. They're dying on the brink of going off into eternity at any moment. That's it. And yet without Christ. Absolutely nothing that they could do on their own. The cross he couldn't, I mean, the thief on the cross, he couldn't take himself down. He couldn't save his life. Were we not the same? We could do nothing on our own, could we? That's it. Yeah. As far as, we might say we were a good person, but really we were no better than the thief, were we? Right. Amen. As far as the seat was full above all things, that's the wicked who can know it. It applies to the good person and the bad person. You know, the thief, the politician, even the preacher, if he's not been saved, his heart's still desperately wicked above all things. Right. His mind is still in enmity with, with God, Romans 8 7 says. Until God changes those things, they will stay that way. That's it. Yeah. We've all seen Romans 8, I mean, Romans 3 23 tells us. He said, We're no better than the thief. We might think we were, we might 
you're not saved here today, you might think you're a pretty all right person. But if you're not born again, then you're no better than this thief hanging on the cross. You're right. You know, in a sense, we were these before God saved us. You might say, how is that? You don't use what God's given you to glorify Him, then you're robbing God. You're right. Amen. And we even do that after we've been born again. We're not careful. I say we all have some sort of talent or some sort of ability that we can use to the furtherance of the gospel and to the glory of God, and yet we, at one point, at least in our lives, we fail to do it. Mm-hmm. Until we see ourselves just like this thief, we will not desire Christ, though. Until you, lost person, until you see yourself as this thief, helpless and incapable of doing anything for yourself, you will not desire Christ. That's it. Well, this, I mentioned the here how he said, this thou not fear God. Well, that was a first requirement for the listed for the Jews over in Deuteronomy. Uh, wrote down somewhere in the notes. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Okay. I'm heading myself a little bit here. Deuteronomy, 5, or Deuteronomy 10, excuse me, there it is. Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 through 13. Here's the Lord speaking to Israel. He says, Now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear God, to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. But keep the commandments of the Lord and his statute which I command thee this day for thy good. The very first thing there he says is the fear of the Lord thy God. Amen. And that's what the repentant thief says to the unrepentant thief. Does thou not fear God? <laughs> fear of God is important in the life of a child of God. Amen. So does not thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation. You know, we really see in these verses here that repentance and faith are present. <laughs> see in verse 41, he owns up to his own doings. But he says, seeing thou art in the same condemnation. You know, it's one thing to be under the man's punishment. It's a totally different thing to be under God's punishment. Right. You know, both of these face man's punishment. They were both going to die. <coughs> Even though he was saved that day, he still had faced the deed that he'd done in this body. He still mm-hmm. had paid for his crimes that he committed. You know, we may pay for the crimes which we do in this body. <laughs> well, praise be God, we'll stand complete before him. Amen. Oh, well, for the unsaved, they will both pay in this body and in all of eternity. Yeah. Well, Hebrews 10, 31 says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Too bad. A man might punish you. A man might put you to death for your crimes. And might walk you away for the rest of your life. Oh, but a far worse thing is to fall in the hands of the living God. To be cast alive in hell and then spend yeah. all the eternity in the lake of fire separate apart from him. Yeah. If thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, he says. <laughs> then he goes on in verse 41. He says, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing in this. He recognizes both his sin and Christ's sinlessness, doesn't he? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. So he didn't make excuses. He didn't say, well, you know, I did it because of that, or I had to feed my family. That's one thing here. Mm-hmm. He readily admits that he's guilty in receiving his due reward. Right. Yeah. And Romans 6, 23 tells us our quote-unquote due reward was weighted as sin as death. That's it. That's what we deserve in our natural state. That's what every, really every sinner born on this earth deserves is death. 
I don't just mean that this body's going to die one day, but death and in that sense, the tail is being separated from God in the lake of fire. Huh. Well, this body will pass unless the Lord comes back. But what, the soul will die, that's for eternity. Let's turn over for just a moment to Psalms 51. If you're familiar with this passage of Scripture, David is repenting. And it's probably the best example of repentance we have in the scripture. True, heartfelt repentance. No matter. You know, a lot of people are sorry that they get caught or sorry but they're not really sorry. <laughs> they go back and keep doing the same old thing again. But notice what, we won't read the whole psalm, but again in verse 1, David says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Amen. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Pay particular attention to verse 4. Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou doest. It says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou hast shall make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin, and blot out all my iniquities. Amen. We say, Create me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. That's true repentance, isn't it? Amen. And really, if we have any less view of sin than David did, then we don't have the right view. That's a completely dishonoring thing to God. That he's, he doesn't wink at it like we oftentimes think he does. Right. No, well, anytime we find ourselves in sin, we ought to cry out as David did, cleanse me, remove this transgression from me. What do he say there? Blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly. Cleanse me from my sin. <laughs> Oftentimes it's more like, oh God, I'm sorry. I'll try not to do it again. Mm, right. I don't know if you're like me, I sometimes end up doing it again anyway. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Well, with the help of God, we can cease from sin. You know, I know we'll have to deal with in this body, but He can give us the victory through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, true repentance, David saw. And this, this thief, he had repentance. He recognized his sin. He said, I'm guilty of it. He didn't say, well, you know, I was wrongly accused, or I don't deserve this, or no, I, I've sinned and I've received my reward for it, he was saying. That's it. But this man, this man, speaking of Christ, he has done nothing amiss. He's done nothing wrong at all. Well, certainly, Christ was a spotless, sinless Lamb of God, wasn't he? Amen. Many recognize him as a good person, quote unquote, but not as a sinless Lamb of God. Let's look there in the same chapter we're in, back at the beginning. Luke 2, 23. Look at where it's for. So then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Amen. In verse 14 he says, well, Pilate speaking again, and he says, Seven to them ye have brought this man to me, as one that rare people, behold, I have examined him before you and found no fault in this man touching those things where he accused him. And he says, No one or yet her Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. You know, Pilate didn't see anything that he'd done wrong. Right. But he didn't see him as the Christ, did he? That's it. So, well, I'll go ahead and chastise him and give him back to you. If he really saw him as the Christ, he wouldn't even have him up there, would he? That's it. You know, he gave it to the people and they said, crucify him, crucify him. So, Paul, or not Paul, Pilate might have thought he was a good person, but he didn't see him as a spotless lamb of God. And I'm afraid that's how many even professing Christians see him today. 
you know, he's a pretty good fellow. He's got good advice, good things to follow. They don't see him as the sinless lamb of God. That's it. What did John say when he saw him coming? John 1.29. The old Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. A few other places that testify to a sinless. This is 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For he made him, taking the price to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that he was all points, all points tempted like as we were, yet without sin. 1 Peter 2.21.22 tells us that he was yet without sin. Or yet did no sin and was no guile found in his mouth. If there was ever a perfect being, it was Christ. Amen. In the flesh. We know that he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, not the same flesh that we're made of. Yet for no fault of his own, yet I mean done nothing amiss, as the thief says, yet he was there on the cross, dying for your sins and for my sins. Verse 42, the thief goes on and he turns to Jesus now and he says, and it says, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remove me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The thief had to make a statement such as this. <laughs> he couldn't have made it out of his own mind, his own thought, thinking. Logically, this was not really a, a comment to be made this time, was it? Well, first of all, who was the thief even to request this of the Lord Jesus Christ? He was a dying thief on a cross. He, in man's eyes, was not worthy to be saved, was he? Right. In man's eyes, he was too far gone. In man's eyes, he had wasted his life being a criminal. But the Lord heard him, didn't he? Amen. Naturally speaking here, Christ did not appear to be a king or a savior this time, did he? He was nailed to a cross, bleeding, weak. He had a mock crown of thorns on his head. Right. He had been stripped of his garments. He appeared anything but kingly, didn't he? Anything but like a savior. But yet, in faith, he cries out to him, Lord, remember me. Amen. It had to be a faith. Couldn't have been of anything else. Another thing I thought of was to identify myself with Christ at this type, not be in his favor, as far as publicly. The whole the crowd was not very happy with Christ, were they? That's to put it lightly. They had cried out, crucify him, crucify him. They had chosen a robber and a murderer, Barabbas, over Christ. They wanted Christ to be stamped out of existence if they could have. Right. He had to identify himself with Christ, but we put himself in that same category. Yep. It wasn't a popular idea to be saved at this particular time. Even the disciples had forsaken him. When they came to arrest Jesus, it said his disciples fled and forsook him. Right. You don't find them at the feet of the cross either. You find them afar off, though, so, and watch him. Wondering what's going on. I guess close enough they could record the conversation going on. But not close enough they would be arrested themselves. Right. Yeah, here he cries out to Christ, the one who had been rejected of men. Lord, remember me, and I'll come unto thy kingdom. Yeah. Except remember the superscription on the cross, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. That's how I knew Christ was coming again in his kingdom one day. Mm -hmm. The name Jesus speaks to his Savior, but he shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. Also, by claiming this man had done nothing to miss, he was really condemning the Jews for crucifying Christ. Well, they thought he was a blasphemer, worthy of death, and yet this man says, Oh, he's done nothing wrong. He's innocent. Amen. Also, we'll notice his request was not a selfish one. It wasn't to be honored or to be glorified or anything like that. Just remember me, he says. You remember when we were studying in Mark a little while back, James and John, what their request was? I think 
Matthew, one of the Gospels records that James and John said it, and the other one says that their mother also requested it. But the one was on the left hand, and one was on the right hand when they came to this kingdom. Well, that was not their place to ask that thing, was it? Amen. And this thief, through the Holy Spirit, knew that. He knew, just remember me, was all he needed. Yeah. Well, he was certainly to be forgotten. Wasn't he? He would certainly be forgotten by society soon. Be gotten rid of. They were be happy to see this thief gone, wouldn't they? This criminal. Over to Ecclesiastes for just a moment. I can't quote this or I would. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. So I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city, where they had so done. This is also vanity. The wicked are soon forgotten, aren't they? That's it. There's countless graveyards in this country that are full of people that have been forgotten by society. Mm -hmm. And so was this thief soon to be forgotten, be a passed off, and yet. He requested the very Lord of Lord, remember me when I come to my kingdom. And we, his testimony here proves that he believed in Christ as Lord and Savior, as King, and as coming again. For otherwise, he wouldn't have said, when thou comest to thy kingdom. Right. But he truly saw Jesus for who he was, unlike the rest of the crowd there. Amen. We'll go to verse 43 real quick before we close. Jesus answers them here. So then Jesus said to him, Verily or truly I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Here we see Christ the Savior. And Christ didn't say he was too late or you got what you deserved or you're not good enough. Rather, he was faithful to his own words in John 6 37. Him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. Amen. Well, that's the promise. Any that come to Christ in faith, he was not going to cast them out. The problem is, natural man doesn't want to come to Christ, does he? That's it. The natural man wants to see, have his own road, his good works, his baptism, and all these other things that they trust in. But when we come to, when comes to Christ in faith, he won't cast them out. He will not reject them. So we don't have to be worried about guiding one wrong if we just hear him to Christ. Amen. Well, Christ is ready to save all that come to him in faith, isn't he? You know, it's not too late. Now even is the perfect time, isn't it? Second Corinthians 6. Well, now is the except of time, well, now is the day of salvation. Amen. So if you're not born again here, today is the day to be saved. Don't put it off any longer. That's right, amen. You're just like a thief on the brink of eternity. You could slip off at any time, and yet you're without Christ. But not only is Christ ready to save those who come to him, he is also able, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, he certainly weak physically in this time, but he was still able to save. To, he still, even to the uttermost, he was able to save, wasn't he? Hebrews seven twenty five says he's able to save even to the uttermost. And he doesn't save us halfway there, and we gotta get the rest of the way there. That's it. Well, he saved us all the way. Luke nineteen ten tells us that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I'm certain he hasn't failed in that mission yet. <laughs> you know, First Timothy one fifteen says that this is a true saying worthy of all expectation that Christ Jesus came. In this world will save sinners of who I am chief. Said. And again, Isaiah 59 1 says, The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. And he is still very much able to save even today. Yeah. Though the world may look 
to be defeated by wickedness, so we may be overtaken by wicked men, so it may be turmoil all around us. Yet God certainly is still able to save us. Amen. The worst of sinners, the best of sinners, the, the young, the old, they just simply come to Christ in faith, he's able to save them. Amen. And he says, Today thou shalt visit me in paradise. Not a thousand years from now, or maybe tomorrow, but today, he says. When we close our eyes in death, we open them somewhere. Amen. The rich man opened them in hell, didn't he? That's it. Just see if he opened them in paradise. Amen. It wasn't purgatory, it wasn't he wasn't soul asleep until Christ returns. No, he was with Christ in paradise. This day Amen. thou shalt be with me. And that is the great comfort of the Christian, that we are to be with Christ after this life is over. All right. And one day we will be forever with the Lord in the new body. Even now to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. Paul Amen. Says. But even now, when we go on by the way of the grave, we'll be in the presence of our Lord and Savior. And a lot of people talk about seeing mama or loved ones or Apostle Paul or disciples, whoever it may be, and we may be able to have time to speak with them, but the greatest joy is to be in the presence of our Lord. Amen. Amen. And I believe Christ longs for that too, to be with his people. He said, in, we say in John chapter 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. We're not so I told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will prepare a place I will come again that I may receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Mm -hmm. Over to be with Christ is the greatest really joy for the Christian. Amen. So we don't have to worry about purgatory or soul sleeping. We don't have to worry about what well, we might not be good enough. So we're going to get turned out when we get there. Amen. And over the child of God, we will be with Christ as soon as we close our eyes in death. Where is your destination today? Is it paradise or is it with Christ? Is it to the gates of hell instead? That's it. You'll be new, you'll new yourself to consider what awaits you in eternity. Amen. Go ahead and close that thought. Amen. Thank you.